It's estimated that in the past 60 years, almost half of all marine biodiversity has been made extinct. Today I want to talk about a couple of experiences uh, I was lucky enough to have out at sea, um, the lessons I learned from those experiences, and how I think those lessons and other lessons can be used to implement better safeguarding of the oceans going forward and why that's important. So about a few years ago, um, when I was a young whippersnapper, before I built all this muscle mass, <laughs> I, um, I was sailing across the oceans, thank you, um, and I was in the middle of the Atlantic, and uh, I found myself with, my, uh, with this boat I was working on as a crew to deliver this boat, and uh, I found myself sailing the boat in a storm, in a really bad storm. And there were only three of us on that boat, and the skipper was below deck, and this girl who was with us had to go up on deck to bring down a sail that was stuck in the riggings that we needed to bring down urgently. And we were not prepared to be in a storm. We had not made the right preparations. We had left stuff that we hadn't fixed. Uh, we hadn't put stuff away. We hadn't unpacked some of the safety equipment. And I'm at the helm of this boat, and this girl goes up on the deck. And normally in these situations, you have these safety lines that you attach to a harness and you put them on this line that runs up the boat. It's like a, a metal cable. And the idea is, is you have two of these. And you put, both of that, you put both of them on. And then when you get up to an obstacle like the mast, you take one off. Bear in mind that you're kind of doing this the whole time because the boat's in a storm. And you're always attached with one point to the boat. But because we hadn't put the safety lines in the right place, we couldn't find them when we needed them. And she went up with only one safety line. And in the moment, that she took that safety line off to get around the mast, a massive wave hit the back of my head. And I watched her, like a rag doll, disappear into the black trough. These situations that they tell you about, where you're supposed to be there and do the things that they train you to do, none of that matters. In that moment, you freeze, your brain goes blank, you are dumb to the situation. And I stood there, frozen for a good five seconds until the skipper screaming at me brought me out back to reality. I reach back, I grab the life buoy, throw it in the water. It's attached by a piece of rope to a beacon, which when it hits the water, it goes up and it flashes. And so the idea is the person in the ocean who's overboard swims towards that beacon and the boat at the same time tries to navigate back to that beacon. And let me tell you, it's a very difficult thing to do at night in a storm. It's a miracle that she survived, and we got her back on the boat. But things could have gone a lot worse. A series of bad decisions, because we were ill-prepared, led us into a cascading, chaotic scenario. A few years later, I had my first job, actually as a trader. And one of the first lessons they teach you as a novice trader, when you're screwing everything up, is that you have to plan the trade and trade the plan. The idea being that before you anticipate what could go wrong and you make preparations for it. And then when things start to go wrong or if they don't, you stick to your trade. You don't change your mind, you stick to your trade. Because if you make a decision in that moment that comes from your gut, that comes from an emotion, you cannot look back objectively and analyze what went wrong. So. I realized that you, you have to really be so prepared for things that leave a state of equilibrium. A different story now. I was about 150 miles off the coast of Colombia, and uh, I woke up after some heavy seeds, and I look out, and from horizon to horizon, just imagine this for a second, close your eyes, a velvet blanket for miles and miles in all direction, covering the ocean, and it's flip-flops. Millions of flip-flops, and they're all left-footed. You can open your eyes now. <laughs> Just want you to visualize that. So 
all of these flip-flops floating around me, and I realized that a container has fallen off a container ship somewhere in front of us. And it just, to my stomach, sickens me to think, wow, we're in the middle of the oceans. We're in the high seas. This is under no jurisdiction. Nobody is truly accountable for what's going on. And I wonder, like, how many more of these containers fall off every year? Well, it turns out it's somewhere between 10 and 20,000 every single year. That's a minimum of two and a half million cubic feet of shit that we don't even talk about when we think about the cruise ships going out to sea and dumping stuff overboard because it's cheaper. Or that we think about the plastic gyres in the middle of the oceans. We're not thinking about, we're thinking about runoff. We're not thinking about over 10,000 containers every single year. And it's just priced into an insurance premium. You know, that's the attitude. So the oceans are a shared resource. And this sucks because it means that they're a victim of something called the tragedy of the commons, which means that all of us individually, if we want to, we can profit, we can benefit from that resource. But everyone shares the negative impact. And because of this, we have international treaties that come together. They come together to try and figure out plans. The Kyoto Protocol, 1994. The Copenhagen Summit, 2009 the Rio summit 2012, to name but a few. But what have they actually achieved apart from laying out lofty goals? They've planned the trade, but have they traded the plan? Because in 2011, the International Program on the State of the Oceans did a big report, a big survey, a big study, and their conclusion, leading oceanographers, was if the current actions contributing to a multifaceted degradation of the world's oceans are not curbed, a mass extinction, unlike anything ever seen in human history, is coming. This is a really big problem. And it's a problem of ownership. Nobody owns the high seas. Countries have jurisdiction up to a certain point, but after that point, there is no accountability. And so, if this is the problem, the only solution that is truly viable is a solution of ownership. And today, I want to talk a little bit about that concept, which is the concept of the oceanic state. A state that can defend itself, that can hold people accountable, that can levy taxes, that can protect and serve and be treated with respect and dignity by the international community. How do we do it? Well, actually, it's not that difficult. It's not that easy. But you, in three steps, can get pretty far. And step number one is creating a permanent population that lives offshore in the oceans. This is because you need a government that's independent of all governments protecting a people to be able to self-declare as a state. Now, the Seasteading Institute was up here a couple of years ago. They're doing amazing things. I hope some of them are here today. Um, but what they're figuring out is how to get populations to live out in the oceans. And it's really important that we expedite that process because that's step one of a much bigger picture, which is to create this oceanic state. The second step after you've done that is you need to define a territory. When we think of territories, we think of land. But that doesn't have to be the case. In international law, territory can be economic territory, which is the area where the citizens of that land benefit from that resource that is able to be available to them through the entity, that sovereign entity. That could be the oceans, 200 miles offshore. That is about 64% of the world's oceans, by the way, which lie 200 miles offshore. That is a territory. Finally, if you really want to be taken seriously, you need to look at international representation. You need to have the UN. You don't, I mean, officially you don't have to have them, but it makes life a lot easier if you want to levy sanctions for people who aren't listening to the rules that you pass. You write a letter to the Secretary General, you submit it, they bring it up in the council, you need to get passed by nine out of 15 members and no vetoes. Yeah, it's a tall order, I understand. But new countries and new mem membership into the UN is not something of a post-colonial era of the 19th or 20th century. These things are happening all the time. Countries are being created all the time. S South Sudan, for example. At least 10 countries were admitted into the UN in the last 10 years of which one, by the way, is Switzerland. So it's an ongoing process. These countries are being defined and formed all the time. 
So yes, it sounds like a lofty goal, but we may be on the brink of a major collapse of mul multiple ecosystems. Who here has been to Switzerland? OK, good. <laughs> Somebody over here definitely has. OK, so when you go to Switzerland, if you're driving, you need to have a pass on your car. And you put that car so that you can use their highways. And you pay 50 euros. And you need to get that pass every time. And it's really annoying. But you do it, because you have to. Otherwise, you get a fine. Over 90% of the world's global commercial system is transported by ship across the oceans. Imagine if we could use microsatellites to police those oceans and tax every single ship that goes through the oceans. And we then use that money as a self-sustaining ecosystem to support the policing of those oceans, which through technology is becoming much, much cheaper and much, much easier. You see, going green is really only half the story. One out of every two of the breaths that you take is because of the oceans. 50% of the CO2 that is sequestered from the atmosphere is because of the oceans. The time is now to plan a dramatic solution for the oceans and then execute that solution. Because without that plan, sustaining life on this planet will remain nothing more than a wish. Happy burn, everybody, and thank you.